Graduates from Taylor, Texas have been soaring to great heights for a very long time. And students today are already making their mark in the world long before graduation. Taylor is full of history, tradition, and an amazing community that supports its future leaders. With all the programs and opportunities available to students today, graduates from Taylor, Texas are soaring higher now than ever before. Our guest today is world-renowned surgeon, Dr. Steve Burkhart. This Taylor Duck was known in high school for his athletic and academic abilities as well as his leadership skills. After graduating as valedictorian of his class, Dr. Burkhart went on to become an orthopedic surgeon, gaining worldwide attention for his advances in arthroscopic shoulder surgery. In today's interview, this Duck Hall of Famer talks about his career Career and the process of developing techniques and devices that have changed the way surgeons around the world care for their patients. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Taking Flight. Our guest today is Dr. Steve Burkhart from the class of 1968. Welcome, Dr. Burkhart, and thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks for the invitation, Tim. I appreciate it. So how does it feel to be back in Taylor for your 50th reunion? Well, it's, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, in some ways, it seems like I never left, but in some ways, it's like a whole different life. And, and when you think about it, it really was a lifetime ago. It was 50 years ago that I graduated from, from high school. So, uh, but, you know, it's been fun to, to so far to see my old friends and to kind of reminisce and to see how the town has changed over the time since I was here. Do you think it's changed quite a bit? Yeah, you know, um, like so many things, you know, progress can be, uh, you know, it can have a double edge to it. You can have a restoration of historic areas, but you can have some uh, strip mall growth and some chains that maybe aren't quite so attractive, but but serve their purpose too. So That's true. overall, I think it's been very good, very good growth. I've Feels good impressed. to be back home, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and right. Taylor, Taylor is certainly not. Uh, a town that is shriveling, it's, it's, it's actually thriving, I can see that. That's true, that's yeah. very true. Where did you go to elementary school? Right here. At, at Northside? At Northside Elementary School. Yeah. What grades did you go to here? One through six. Yeah, One through I think, six. I'm trying to remember, I think I was in the first grade the first year that it opened, I believe. Really? Which would have been uh, 1950, uh, well that would be 55 to 56, I think. I believe that's when it opened, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. So do you recall if you had a class in this room where we are right now? Yeah, this was Miss Patterson's third grade Is classroom. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lois was that Miss Lois Patterson? Yeah, yes. yeah she was uh, quite a hoot. She's, uh, she kind of reminded me a little bit, once I got to know Naomi Posman later, they have kind of similar personalities, but very uh, uh, articulate, very uh, much of an encouragement to young people uh, to, to achieve their their utmost goals. So it must bring back some memories being here on this campus today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now you graduated from Taylor High School on 7th Street. Correct. Class of 1968. So what was it like in Taylor, Texas for teenagers in the 1960s? You know, I think it's uh, a little bit like you might think it would be in, in watching some of the movies uh, about that era, actually. You know, it was just before the campus protests of the late 60s were getting going and so it was kind of included that more tranquil happy days type era and um, you know it was just a, a good solid community to grow up in it was after world war ii most of the uh, my classmates fathers had served in world war ii and they were happy to be home they were really anxious to build a life here uh, in taylor after the war and uh, they were just hardworking, honest people that would teach you good life values and, and I think it was a fantastic place. But in terms of you know making the drag and that sort of thing, maybe they still do that, but that was typical of the 60s. True. What all did y'all do for fun? Well, you know, for me personally, I, I got really involved in sports and I liked, I liked that and uh, you know, even in my spare time, you know, I like to do sports. I, I was never a good golfer, but would go out with my friends and play golf. And we'd uh, 
uh, play tennis a lot of times in the evenings in the summertime, would swim, that type of thing. And I also enjoyed, we'd, we'd have uh, kind of get-togethers down by the San Gabriel River, and that was just beautiful in the summertime, too, and I kind of enjoyed. I wasn't much of a fisherman, but I liked to try my luck fishing in the San Gabriel. Some good memories. Yeah. yeah. You were very involved in high school. Uh, you were involved in, in academics, you were involved in leadership roles, you were involved in athletics. What are some of your favorite memories from high school? Well, you know, high school was a lot of fun, and, and I uh, had so many good friends there. I had so many good experiences and so many opportunities. And one of the things that I really, in retrospect, liked about it was I could participate in so many things. You know, it wasn't like a, a huge class of a thousand in San Antonio, which is, you know, unfortunately what my kids were in and when they graduated from high school. So you could be an individual and you could uh, seek a leadership role, you could seek a, you know, a, a key role on an athletic team and have a chance of, of making it. In fact, if you did one in good, if you did well in one sport, they'd want you to do every sport. So, uh, so that you know, kept you busy. Yeah, I mean, you add, you add it up and pretty soon there are enough days in the week for it. So. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But I bet you enjoyed every, every bit of it. Oh, I did. Yeah. I really did. Your achievements in high school were really remarkable, including being valedictorian, a national merit finalist, a scholarship to Rice University, and your path after high school has taken you into the medical field. And your work as a doctor and a surgeon has had a tremendous impact worldwide. Did you know in high school that you wanted to become a doctor? Uh, I knew that I would like to do something in a profession that uh, would be a helping profession of some sort, whether it was, uh, and, and that covered a broad spectrum. I mean, I, I thought about a lot of different things, and including teaching, coaching, uh, even military service, you know, at a professional, as a professional soldier, potentially at that time. In fact, even applied to the Air Force Academy, which is, <laughs> I, I didn't get in because I was colorblind, ironically. Oh, really? I flunked the color vision test. I would have, I, otherwise, I would have gone to the Air Force Academy, and I would have been a pilot, never been a doctor. And uh, wow. so, so actually, the, you, you think about some of the ways that, that fate or d divine providence kind of leads you one way or another. That was one for me. But I did want to, so then... I think number one on our list, though, really was to be a doctor. It's just that, you know, it wasn't a given in Taylor that you would even go to college, much less four more years of medical school, much less five more years of residency, much less fellowship training after that. And you start adding it up, and, it, you know, my training was 14 years after high school. So, and it was a bit daunting because there were so many unknowns, not only the number of years, but the potential cost. I didn't know if there would be any way I could afford that. So I took it one step at a time and uh, decided to major in engineering, mechanical engineering in college. And then while I was there, I, as a, just as a kind of a safety factor, just in case I went to medical school, I took my electives as pre-med courses like organic chemistry and biology. And, uh, and then when I realized that uh, it was going to be feasible to go to medical school, then I had all my prerequisites. So, mm -hmm. so you know. So I, it kind of developed over that period of time. Yeah, it did. And, uh, and you know, it all kind of started, too. And when you think back, how does that relate to Taylor? You know, I think that there was a lot of encouragement for reading. You ask about my pastimes, but uh, reading was one of my favorite things to do. And the public library was one of my favorite places to go. Uh, in the in the summertime, when I was a kid, uh, we most of what we had to read at home. My parents bought a set of encyclopedias, and I was fascinated by that. I read the whole thing, every volume of it, and uh, <laughs> so that was a, a part of my general education there. It's been said that your work is the reason that repairing a torn rotator no longer requires opening up the shoulder. In fact, you're often referred to as a pioneer in minimally invasive shoulder repair surgery. Could you discuss a little bit some of the innovative techniques and devices that you have developed that has been such a game changer in shoulder repair surgery? Well, this could be uh, a very long story, but I'll try, to, <laughs> I'll try to summarize it, I guess, as best I can. Um, 
you know, when I went through my orthopedic training, all surgery was being done with open incisions. And to actually get to the spot that you needed to work on, you had to make an incision through perfectly normal tissues, and you had to unfortunately damage those tissues. And then you had to repair them on the way back out. And um, about the time I was doing my fellowship, and uh, after I'd finished my residency at Mayo Clinic, I, um, I decided to do a sports fellowship because they were putting an emphasis on arthroscopy of the knee. That was just beginning, and I wanted to learn that. And I, so as a, as a resident at the Mayo Clinic, we had done open knee surgery, and athletic knee surgery was always by open incision. And it took a long time to recover from those things. And so then when I was doing my fellowship, we did the same things, essentially, through puncture wounds. And the difference in the morbidity of that was incredible. The patients that had the minimally invasive arthroscopic surgery got well so quick. Um, and I thought, you know, this probably should be done for all the joints. It just happened to start with the knee. Well, as, as it happened, uh, when I got hired for my, my job in San Antonio, they wanted me to have, I would do general orthopedics, but they wanted me to have a special interest in sports medicine and shoulder surgery. And uh, so that encompassed primarily knee and shoulder surgery. So I was, right off the bat, was doing a lot of knee arthroscopy. But I started um, thinking that we really should be doing things in the shoulder. The problem is that, that the set of, of uh, problems that you're presented with in the shoulder was totally different from the knee. And therefore, the instruments and the repair techniques and the repair constructs were going to be totally different, too. So you had to have a whole different way of, of looking at things and working on things and operating on things. I did my first uh, shoulder arthroscopy in 1983, and at that time, in the early 80s, there were probably seven or eight of us in the world that, that were doing them. And we weren't able to do very much, but we were able to learn a lot. And we could learn, and, and you think about it, no one had ever looked at the shoulder joint from inside out you only looked at it as you're going from outside in. So you knew how it looked from that angle of approach. But when you take the reverse direction, and you, it, you, it was hard to know even what was normal and what was pathologic. So the first thing we had to do was to define what the pathology was. And so the, the seven or eight of us, that, and we were all in the US, became close friends. And we would send videos back and forth. And we'd argue about what's normal, what's abnormal, what's the cause of this problem. And uh, so we really, it took us a few years, I think, to sort out the major pathologies. And then we realized that some of them we could work with the knee instruments, but most of them we needed entirely new instrumentation. So after having thought that I had totally wasted my time getting a mechanical engineering degree in college at Rice, I found that that was, uh, I think, a, a a, it allowed me to have a lateral way of looking at medical problems, kind of a lateral uh, thinking type of approach to it that people who didn't have that background couldn't look at it uh, with. So, so that was the lens that I looked at uh, shoulder surgery through. So I had some ideas. I got some prototypes made up uh, through a, an aircraft machinist in San Antonio, some designs I had, and, um, and they actually worked would work quite well for certain things. I tried to get some of the bigger instrument companies interested, and they said, no, there's never going to be a market for this. We, we, they said, we could understand the knee, but there's not going to be a market for shoulder instruments. So one day I was at a, at a medical meeting, and they have these areas, part of almost like a trade show, where the uh, companies exhibit their things. And uh, there was a little card table, about like this, a little table. And one guy behind it who was the president of this company, which uh, had two employees, and he was just desperate to get products. He didn't really have much. He had one product that he was showing, and he would show it over and over again. And uh, so I went and started talking to him about my ideas for shoulder instruments. And we both had nothing to lose on the deal. I mean, I didn't have anyone that wanted my ideas. He didn't have any products to sell. Perfect match. And so it was a perfect match. And so we decided uh, right then that we'd work together toward the shoulder. And as it turns out, one of his two employees was an engineer who became a very good friend of mine. And he'd never been in the operating room. So I invited him to come and observe some surgeries. 
and uh, kind of stand in the corner. He, would, he could see on the monitor, like a TV screen, what was going on, and I would point out to him what the pathology was. And then he would come over to my house in the evenings, and we would just sketch out ideas of instrumentation and implants of how to solve the problems. And that's how it all got started. And uh, so fast forward, so that was about in the late 80s, early 90s, maybe 91 or so. So fast forward to about 2006, I guess. And by then, this company that was a nothing company was a, a worldwide company and had, um, it was the largest medical device company in arthroscopic surgery in the world. So it was incredible how fast it grew. So that doesn't happen by accident either. <clears throat> and uh, so, so the owner of the company had, had a real talent for setting up a sales force. But what we were trying to do, and I think we were both pretty naive, was we were attempting to uh, create a paradigm shift in shoulder surgery because it had been done by open means since the late 1800s. Once you, I mean, once you had ether anesthesia and they could do anything, it was always open. And um, so the, the world's experts were totally entrenched in the thing that had made them experts, which was open shoulder surgery. And they were threatened by actually some young upstarts coming along and saying, oh, we have a better way. It would and change their whole way of doing things. Well, they wouldn't be experts anymore. That's right. One thing. <laughs> and it was intimidating because mm -hmm. it was a totally different type of skill that I know that they were intimidated thinking they might not be able to learn those skills because it's a three-dimensional type thing where you're having, and I think the kids that do the video games would be much better at it now, but um, you're having to work down here while you're looking at your instruments on a TV screen six or eight feet away from you. And so you're doing this, and so you have to have a good 3D sense. And uh, I think if you haven't done that, you know, kind of as a younger person, it's hard as say you had a 60-year-old open shoulder surgeon, it would be hard for him to learn to do it. So they were threatened. Mm -hmm. But so how do you achieve a paradigm shift? I mean, the, the earlier generation either has to convert or they have to, you have to outlast them. And then they eventually retire, and then you've convinced the younger generation that's the way to go, and you do that through education. So that was a part of what my uh, mission was all the way through. I got very involved in the Arthroscopy Association of North America. I became the president of that in 2002. And our mission was to teach arthroscopy of all the joints around the world. And so we did that through, through that organization, the company that I've worked with, uh, Arthrex, they have had a major mission of teaching surgeons how to uh, do uh, knee and shoulder arthroscopy. And, uh, you know, if you teach enough people how to do it and they become proficient at it, then, you know, I've had, I've had literally, I think last count, we've had about 6,000 surgeons from around the world visit me in the operating room. And, you know, the typical meeting, I, I speak at uh, an average of about 15 meetings in the U.S. and, and also international. And, every year that average about a thousand surgeons in the audience. So that's reaching a lot of people over the and years. And they are interested in changing to to this minimally invasive procedure. Yeah, the interesting thing was is that we went into it very naively thinking we could achieve a paradigm shift, not even thinking that it was a paradigm shift. But then when I realized that that's what we were hoping to achieve, I thought, no, that's too grandiose. It's never going to happen. What we'll probably achieve is there'll be a small cluster of good surgeons that'll know how to do it, and that'll be good enough for people who but need it. But it's grown it. far beyond that. Oh, now it's the standard of care. Mm -hmm. And I never dreamed that it would become the standard of care during my career before right. I, you know, I'm still in practice. And, and it's very gratifying. It to, must be to have had such an impact on so many people and their quality of life and the way surgeons care for their patients. But you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, you have to have a thick skin when you go through something like that because, you know, I had uh, some of the older surgeons that, you know, <laughs> it's almost like political debates. You know, they call you a liar, they call you all sorts of things, and, you know, you <clears throat> and you have to have a, th a thick skin, you have to be persistent, but then you have to realize that you're not going to con convert the people that have their minds set against it already. And there was, there's a, uh, was a famous shoulder surgeon in the early 1900s, um, uh, E.A. Codman, and he had, I thought, a great quote where he was that way. He was kind of a contrarian and did things, said things that other surgeons 
didn't like. They thought that he was very radical in his approach, and it turned out people ended up adopting his open techniques over the years. But he said at the, toward the end of his career, he said he, he regretted that he spent so much time um, sort of wishing that he could please the experts of the day because he said what he really realized eventually was he, he wanted the approval of his students and not the, his masters. So mm -hmm. I thought that was very interesting. Well, that affects the next generation. Yeah, and yeah. that's what it's all about. You that's wanna, true. You want to leave the world a better place. That's true, looking toward the future. Yeah. Well, that's just amazing. What an amazing journey yeah. that has benefited so many people. It's been a lot of fun. It's been, it's been uh, an experience I never thought I'd have. And you, you know, I couldn't. So many things happen that you know you have to react to. You know, there's there's not only, um, uh, I guess, a positive action that you that you overtly set out to achieve a certain goal, but you have to react then to either positive or negative forces that come back at you. So, That's true. Yeah. And different things that occurred in your life up to this point all played a part in the direction that that, that pathway took you. Yeah, oh, that's true. Yeah, um, you mentioned a while ago speaking and and having other surgeons come and observe. With uh, having had such an impact in the medical community, you must be in high demand for speaking, for writing, uh, medical journals, books. Could you talk a little bit about that part of your career? Sure. Um, well, let's talk about the speaking first. All right, and. Uh, once I decided, I got into this game a little bit late because when I decided that I was going to really start pushing uh, to try to teach people how to do these things, I was already past 40, which you know I thought was maybe too late to get a whole lot done during the rest of my career. But so I decided to go at it full bore, and um, so one of the things, so I accepted pretty much every speaking invitation that I got, and there was a lot of interest in it. And uh, my wife, Nora, and I had a conversation uh, right after um, I had decided that I was going to be, go on a series of international lectures and talk about shoulder arthroscopy. <clears throat> and uh, we, and I didn't know anything about this movie, but I said, you know, I think this, it seems like that's living a little dangerously, because some of these countries were countries I wasn't even so sure about, and uh, Asia, and and South America, and so she said, well, we'll watch a movie, and just, we talked about that. So I decided, okay, I heard there's this new movie, The Year of Living Dangerously. I said, that sounds appropriate, let's watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was actually, there were riots over in Asia in that movie, and I never got into anything like that, although one of the trips I was on to Venezuela, which you know how bad that is now, I was in Venezuela giving some lectures the first time that Hugo Chavez uh, overthrew the government there, and they shut the airport down, and I was stuck for days thinking that I didn't know what was going to happen. Oh, no. So some interesting things have happened with the travel. So, so, that, so looking at the travel, that's one thing. Primarily, I, I usually go about two or three times a year overseas now to big meetings to speak. I do probably one meeting per month in the U.S. at, a, at one of the bigger meetings. So I still have a, you know, a big, uh, you know, a good platform where I can reach out and teach people the latest things we're doing. And we, I still feel like we're doing, taking it up to the next level. Mm -hmm. Then if you, the other things you asked me about were um, <clears throat> the articles and the books. Um, you know, I've published, I felt like, I, I felt I had the responsibility if I was going to be doing this type of surgery to prove that the results were good. And so when you look at a totally new discipline, okay, you look at shoulder arthroscopy, what we were doing basically is building a ship in a bottle. We were doing the same thing that you would do with an open incision, but you couldn't put your hands in there and do it. You had to start the construction outside and find a way to transfer the construction inside and complete it once it was inside. So it literally was building a ship in a bottle, and you had to have some very unique ways to solve all those problems. And, you know, people weren't going to believe that you could really do it unless, number one, they saw you do it. So you had to be able to edit your videos and teach them how you do it, and even do live surgery and transmit it back to the, to the audience and so they can see, yeah, you know, this is, you can really do it. 
And then you had to report your results to show that you weren't doing harm to people, that you're at least as good as the old technology, but hopefully better. And so, so from an ethical standpoint, I said, okay, I know that I'm doing the exact same operation I would do with an open incision, only I'm doing it better because I don't have to make the big incision. And then we, with my biomechanics background, I said, though, even though it looks great, I'm going to go in the biomechanics lab, we'll do these same repairs in cadavers, and then we'll pull test them to failure, and we'll see if they fail at the same or better force or higher forces than when we did it open, just with a, tying the knots and everything by hand. And we found that they were actually better. And so we did the biomechanical bench research, then we, did the, we followed the patients along, you needed to have at least two to five year follow up to how these patients do over time. And the, the clinical results were incredibly better than what the open results had been. And so, you know, once people saw that, then, you know, then it was just kind, kind of just a huge wave of enthusiasm that just washed over the orthopedic field. And everyone wanted to be, and part of it too, you reached a critical mass where, I mean, human nature plays into it. You know, it, you, see, you see your friend at church who'd had a rotator cuff repair and they find, you find out it was arthroscopic. And then your doctor said, well, he's gonna make a big incision. You wanna go see the guy who can do it arthroscopic. Then the surgeon down the street who has been telling people you can only do it open incision, he finds out he's losing patience because his competitors are in arthroscopic. So now he's got to learn arthroscopic. Mm -hmm. so, yes. so anyway, it's just, uh, it's been an interesting process. And then the final part of it, the books, you ask about the books. Yes. Um, you know, I did write one work of fiction many years ago. I don't know if you want to even ever get into that, but it was a <laughs> laser burn was the name of it, but it was actually a, a medical fiction book. And some of my opponents would say that everything I've written about the shoulder is fiction too, but uh, <laughs> I'd like to, to beg to differ on that. But uh, I've written three books on shoulder surgery. And I wanted to have a, a fresh approach on how to do that because when I was in, the tra in training at Mayo Clinic, we had kind of the Bible of orthopedic surgery was Campbell's Orthopedics. And it was a three volume set and you'd read this and it had a little sketch, little line drawings and very dry prose that when you finished reading it, sometimes you still wouldn't know how to do the operation. So I said, I want to have a book that will have so many photos and it's going to have a little more readable text, you know, um, more like you would use in writing a novel rather than just a, a, a textbook. And, and I want to have videos to accompany it too. So we had accompanying DVDs with it. That came with the book? Yeah. Huh? And so that way you had all the aspects of, of learning available to your students that way. And uh, so we wrote the first book. We couldn't, we couldn't get anyone interested in that initially either until um, I met with an editor from Lippincott, which I was so surprised. He was, uh, I had, had met him through a friend of mine, another doctor, and he was a senior editor at Lippincott and they did, uh, they were probably the largest medical publisher in the U.S. at the time. And I, I pitched this idea to him, and he was so interested. And then I pitched the idea that we wanted to have this cowboy angle. That it would be the, the cowboy's guide to shoulder arthroscopy. And I thought, well, that, that's a deal killer there. And he said, oh, that sounds fantastic. You know, that's a great hook. So well, tell us about this cowboy <laughs> theme. <laughs> well, you know, I can show you the, the books. We've done three of these now. And uh, so just to back up a little bit, those of us who were doing shoulder arthroscopy in the early days, our detractors called us cowboys. And you know, it's like, I, I've always loved cowboys. I mean, Roy Rogers was my hero growing up, but then, you know, certain cynics have found ways to turn cowboy into something bad. Well, so they called us this derogatory phrase of cowboy surgeons. And so I thought, well, that's pretty cool because, you know, cowboys are great guys. You know, they're, they, they, uh, to protect people, they shoot straight, they tell the truth, you know, what's wrong with that? Um, so, but what I pitched to this, uh, to this editor was that I want to make the book fun. And I think that one of the things we can do here is I'll be like the, uh, the trail boss. <clears throat> and I'm going to address my reader almost as a trail boss. And I'm going to start each chapter out with some nugget of Western wisdom. 
And, and people my age will know that the men in Taylor coming back home after World War II, they, they, a lot of them spoke this way. They had these great phrases that were so pithy they could say volumes in just a few words. And, you know, instead of saying, you know, um, you can, you know, you really need to work hard because you'll succeed. Well, they'd say, no, no man ever drowned in his own sweat, okay. <laughs> or, you know, about taking chances, they'd say, if you ain't sitting on the edge, you're, you're taking up too much space. So that's a great one there, too. And, so, and every chapter begins with one of those. Every chapter begins yes. with that. And then I tried to somehow obliquely relate that to the topic of that chapter, too. And, you know, that I took a little maybe a bit of literary license to do that. But it, but it, it caught on with people. They loved mm -hmm. it. And, and I found out people would tell me the first thing they would do when they would buy the book they turn to the beginning of each chapter because they wanted to read the quotes. <laughs> they wanted that first. <laughs> yeah. So, so the uh, whole cowboy idea worked very well. Oh, it worked fantastic. Yes. And, uh, and so now, and just to kind of go full circle, we have uh, three big meetings every year <clears throat> that uh, I'm the chairman of that are actually sponsored by this company, Arthrex, that, uh, that I've worked with all these years. And we, we call them the cowboy way of shoulder arthroscopy. And uh, so they, uh, you have to do online registration. It, it sells out like within, I mean, when the company makes it known that these, that these um, meet, meetings are available, and we have about 300 spots for each one, they sell out within about 15 minutes. So it's just incredible how much enthusiasm there is still. Oh, so, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. And are your books uh, easily available uh, for people that might be listening to this and want to go check them out? Well, they are, and you can even order them on Amazon. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, I think they could probably even find segments of the videos online on YouTube mm -hmm. or places. They just end up different places like right. that. Yeah. You know, I love the cowboy theme. And yeah. I'm so glad that worked out and people really went for it. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, one of, I was, you know, one of the things I get on my soapbox with sometimes with uh, uh, people from my uh, friends of mine from other states, and uh, they, they'll say something derogatory about uh, cowboys. They say, you know, cowboy's a good thing. That's, the cowboy made Texas what it is. Yes. And the things that you admire about Texans, those are cowboy traits. Mm -hmm. So don't be, don't be talking bad on cowboys. <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> That's exactly right. Dr. Burkhart, for some of our students who may be watching this video and are taking the health science courses and are planning to go into some type of career that is health related, and especially those who may want to become doctors, become surgeons, could you, t uh, could you talk a little bit about the path after high school that you took that eventually led to where you are today so they kind of know what to expect that's ahead of them? Sure. Yeah, well, I'll talk about what I did, but then I'll also kind of talk about, you know, possibilities. Uh, you know, there's no road map that's really going to get you somewhere. I mean, there are routes from A to, to B, but it, they can be very circuitous routes. And, and if you think you're going to find a highway to take you to the, your goal, that's not going to happen. So I think you take it a stage at a time. And you're always, you always want to be prepared. Uh, like I said, when I was in high school, it wasn't a given that you were going to go to college even. But you wanted to have all the prerequisites for it, and, and, and if, if your goal is to ultimately be a doctor, then, you know, you need to plan to go to college, obviously. And then once you get to college, you need to, to plan to take the pre-med requirements and that sort of thing. And realizing interests might change, circumstances in your life might change, opportunities may either appear or vanish. So um, I think that if you look at it, and, and as far as my career is sort of an example of that, when I uh, was a senior in high school and looking at colleges, I thought that, you know, I, I would have wanted to go to Rice. My, my concern about going to Rice University is I thought, well, I probably may not be able to compete there because we didn't have high school calculus. We didn't have maybe all the big city courses. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll get there and I'll fail. And then I just had to kind of, you know, talk myself off the ledge and say, well, no, I think I've got to go there and find out if I'll fail. And I got there and I found out, well, those guys aren't so smart, you know. And uh, so then, you know, uh, then I went to medical school. I, I didn't think for a couple of reasons that I could go uh, financially. And then I wasn't sure 
you know, what it would take academically to get in. I found out, yeah, you know, I could satisfy the academic requirements and, you know, what, what, what extra money I needed at that time I could, I could borrow. The loans were pretty readily available. And so then, uh, after I finished uh, medical, or was toward getting toward the end of medical school, thinking about what training to do, I decided orthopedic surgery was what I wanted to do, and I interviewed at all the Texas programs, but I thought, you know, they have such a good program at Mayo Clinic that if I could get into that, I should probably do that. And so, uh, so I got an interview at Mayo Clinic. I was surprised I got an interview. And I said, man, that's a long ways away. I, I, I had never flown on an airplane. And so I think I was probably the last guy in history to drive for an interview from Texas to Minnesota <laughs> to interview for a residency position. I drove, so my wife, Nora, and I drove up there. And, uh, and two days later, I got a phone call. I said, if you, if you want the position, it's yours. And so there again, it's sort of like, wow, I'm shocked that they would take me. But, and this is so different. I mean, I've never lived in you know, below zero cold in the winter, and we might go get up there and be, get frozen to death. And it's stupid things you think about, but I thought, gosh, that opportunity, I, I need to take it. And so, so one of the things, so, so I, I always tried to take the best opportunity I could. And if I failed, and I guess it's a version of the Peter Principle, but you want to eventually, you'll fail, and you'll find out either you don't go that direction or you don't, you, or you're going to be satisfied with where you are, one rung below, one or the other. But I've always told my kids, I said, when you think about succeeding in life, one of the things that Coach Short used to say at Taylor High School, he was, he was one of the football coaches and was a great role model. And it was actually his paraphrase of a Vince Lombardi quote, the Pac famous Packers quote, uh, coach rather. And uh, he said, run to daylight. He said, you know, all the great running backs run to daylight. And, um, <clears throat> and so I've realized that in life, sometimes that opportunity is just a little crease of, of vision, a little crease of daylight you can see, and not very much, but it, the closer you get to it, maybe it's enough to squeeze through. And so you don't want, you don't want to avoid those things. You don't want to avoid challenges, but if there's a little daylight there, that's where you go. Yeah. That's pretty sound advice. That's yeah. very good. For these future doctors, um, surgeons, medical professionals who or completing high school and wanting to go in this direction and begin this career, what do you think is the most important thing they should know about becoming a doctor? You know, I think that the thing they need to know about being a doctor is not, it's not just a job. You know, it's, um, it's a calling, it's a lifestyle, it's uh, it's a burden and it's a blessing. It's all those things together. Um, you'll, as you go through it, you'll just be overwhelmed by the amount of work that is to be done and how you're expected to do it on so little sleep and, and you'll be physically pressed to your boundaries in some cases. Um, you'll have decisions to make that are gonna be potentially life-changing for patients either for better or for worse, depending on the outcomes. And, uh, and people are gonna depend on you. You know, you have to realize it, it's a serious job. You know, it's not, uh, it's not just something, like a friend of mine uh, who's a surgeon used to say, he said this job's about a lot more than just putting scars on people. So it, it, it affects their lives. And, and so you have to, and, and you know, I've also seen some doctors, I think, that would somewhat shirk their responsibilities um, if there was a, a complication, they would try to push it off over to somebody else to take care of it or whatever. But, you know, you just, I think a good doctor is able to handle the problems. You anticipate what complications there might be and you're willing to take those on too. You take the bad with the good. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Going back to your roots at Taylor High School, how do you think your high school experience helped prepare you for your future? You know, I, I feel like I had this storybook uh, high school experience in a way. Um, it, you know, there wasn't uh, a lot of, here in Taylor there wasn't a lot of conflict. I mean, sure, uh, kind of towards the, the end of high school was when we started getting the campus protests and the Vietnam War and that sort of thing. 
But for most of my childhood and even most of my high school, things were just very tranquil, idyllic, and uh, there wasn't, you didn't have so many of the problems you see now with drugs. I mean, it, it, I mean there were some, obviously there were some alcohol uh, problems, but uh, you didn't have the drugs out in the schools like you have now. You didn't worry about bullying so much. Yeah, there were bullies, but you didn't worry about it so much. And in fact, you know, I think that was part of the ethic of the of that of the day, was that uh, you guys like us, you know, you, we wouldn't tolerate bullies, and if they were picking on on the little guy, you know, you'd be sure they wouldn't do it for very long. And uh, so I think we had. Uh, I think that the thing I learned the most that, that stood me in good stead through, uh, through my later life was just kind of the, <clears throat> just an ethical framework that I got in Taylor and I got it through all the people around me, through my parents and my family, my, uh, my friends, my mentors, which I had some really good ones at Taylor High School. You know, uh, Coach Short, I mentioned Coach Shirley, uh, coach, uh, well, Ms. Posman, she was fantastic. Ms. Manner, so we had, I just don't want to, I, I could go on and on, but I'd say those four were the, the main ones. And uh, I think that I was fortunate that I, I grew up in a time and a place when a man's word was his bond, too, and you don't see that as much anymore, unfortunately. I think uh, a lot of people have taken the, the view that, you know, if you can get away with it, it's okay. But uh, and if you if you do if you carry through on what you're going to say and you have that, that framework of ethics that uh, what you what you promise is what you're going to deliver. I think that that's the, the thing that has stood me in good stead. The other thing is I learned, and some people call it uh, stubbornness. I call it tenacity. But you know I think that when you're in t at Taylor High School, you know, you're, you're expected to do a lot. If you were an athlete, they wanted you to play every sport. And if you were in student leadership, you should be on the student council and class officer. So anyway, you know, you had to be uh, a little tenacious to achieve your goals if you can do it in that many different areas. But you were given those opportunities. And so I think all those things kind of came together for me and I think were influences for me. We mentioned a while ago that this was this is your 50th uh, school reunion and another school reunion that was pretty special was your 30th uh, when you were inducted into the Taylor High School Duck Hall of Fame. Yeah. What was that like to receive that kind of an honor from your classmates? Well I was uh, I was really surprised pleasantly surprised obviously but um, you know, the, the uh, instigator of that was Sharon Thompson Bland, who unfortunately uh, died last year, but uh, I found out later she had, had interviewed all sorts of people about me, finding, about, finding out about me and my career behind my back. And she was so gracious and so generous and so uh, g gave such a, a glowing uh, introduction to me back at that uh, at that award ceremony that I, I'll never forget it. And, you know, to have my friends and my family there, my, uh, my parents were there too, as I recall, and uh, it was just a, a great day. Now, you were also inducted at the same time as actor Rip Torn. Yeah, yeah, he kind of stole my thunder. You know, <laughs> I, I can't compete with Hollywood. <laughs> Did you know ahead of time that he was also being inducted? I knew that I had had read about it, or I'd been told about. It, I think the day before. But uh, the interesting thing: his parents lived uh, one, no, two blocks away from me in Taylor, and uh, so I used to ride my bike to school right past their house. And my mother told me, you know, their son is an actor out in Hollywood. And uh, then, as as I got older, I saw hey, he's does a pretty good job. He's been in some good movies. So. Yes, getting some awards. Yeah. And then you were inducted into the Duck Hall of Fame with him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's pretty neat. A familiar phrase around Taylor, and especially at homecoming, is once a duck, always a duck. Yeah. What does that phrase mean to Steve Burkhart? You know, it's, I think it stresses how important your roots are. And, um, 
there's a, that ridiculous quote by Thomas Wolfe, you can never go home again. And of course he couldn't go home again because he wrote books uh, exposing all the, all the frailties of all the people in his town. But, uh, but I think if you appreciate what you've got in your town and you have benefited from it, and uh, I think it's great to be able to go home again. And like I said, I think um, the role models I had in Taylor uh, were just beyond compare. I think of uh, the, the life lessons I, w I learned. And not, I don't want to emphasize, overly emphasize the men, but you know, a young boy grows up to be a man. And so you want to have role models that are men that have good qualities. And, and I, when I think back, there were so many of uh, the men in my dad's generation, my dad and his, his friends and his, other people in town, the coaches, like I mentioned, Coach Short, Coach Shirley, just rock solid people. They're just really out of the old rock. And uh, so I, I was very grateful for that. We've talked a lot about Dr. Steve Burkhart, the world renowned surgeon. But tell us about Steve Burkhart when you're not being a physician. I've really become um, more uh, aware, I guess, of the importance of what you do in your free time and to use those times wisely. And I've been so fortunate in my life to have uh, my family support, my wife, Nora, who um, we have so many of the same interests. Um, and then our, our son and daughter <clears throat> that are both grown, our, our three grandchildren. and. Um, so I like to spend time with family. And now that our grandkids are very close to us there um, at, at Bernie, where we live outside of San Antonio, um, I go to Little League ball games, I go to school programs, and you know, pitch some batting practice in the yard, that type of thing. Um, but I also like to, uh, to hunt and fish, but I, and I particularly enjoy uh, habitat management. We, we live on a ranch outside of Bernie uh, we've owned it for a number of years, but we built a house there five years ago and moved out there and now I commute into San Antonio. But try, you know, just learning about the things about the habitat that make it optimal for the wildlife, particularly the deer and the turkeys out there, and, and then the water resources. Our ranch has the headwater springs of three different creek systems, so just doing what we can to preserve that and maintain the spring flow and, not, and, and the native grasses and the types of things that uh, just trying to keep it uh, as natural as possible, keeping the invasive species out. So uh, I really enjoy that. And, uh, and that encompasses a lot of things. I mean, it gets you out there to exercise, you're doing some hiking, you're maybe cutting down some trees, you're, um, you're just being outdoors is, I think, a healthy lifestyle. And for someone who loves the cowboy style, that's a perfect setting. Oh, I love it? that. <laughs> I don't ride horses too much anymore, but uh, I think there reaches a time that the cowboy just doesn't get up, back up on the horse. But right. uh, just enjoys being out in the country. Enjoy being in the country. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, true. Dr. Burkhart, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I want to say congratulations on all of your accomplishments, but I also want to say thank you for all the contributions that you have made to the medical community and for the big difference that you have made. And I'd like to ask you one final question. What piece of advice do you have that you could share with others that would help them reach their goals and achieve success? Um, you know, that's uh, <clears throat> it's a tall order to, to put something into just a very uh, encapsulated uh, bit of advice, but I think if, if I had to do that, what I would say is um, tenacity is, is one of the virtues you really need to have to achieve the goals you want, whatever they might be in life. And as I was looking to write the preface for our second shoulder surgery book, I came across a quote by Mahatma Gandhi that I thought was just incredibly apt for the type of struggle and the stages of conflict that I had gone through fighting the powers that be to try to achieve this paradigm shift. And, uh, but Gandhi said, he had this fantastic quote, he said, talking about his opponents, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So that's tenacity in a nutshell. And that's very good advice. Thank you very much for sharing that. And thank you again for joining us today on Taking Flight. It has been a pleasure visiting with you today. 
And thank you for joining us for this episode of Taking Flight. We'll see you next time.